Sigma notation and those sums have a lot of interesting properties, but we're going to list a few of the, those properties and a few formulas that are sort of your baseline things that you're going to see a lot. The first two, or rather the first one, is that if I have some sort of constant times a sequence, that I can pull the constant out of that sum. So if it's three times something every time, I can pull that three out front and just evaluate the sum with some other formula and then at the end of the day multiply that. So what you find is that it works pretty similarly to the uh, idea that, that we developed with antiderivatives, the idea that we developed with derivatives, that constants can be factored out. The second one is that if I have two sequences that are added or subtracted, I can break them up into separate sums. And that's true in the case where n is finite. Now, if you have what's known as an infinite sum, that's something we'll get to eventually, you have to be very careful with this. That doesn't all, it is not guaranteed to be true in the case of an infinite sum. But in the case of a finite sum, you can break these, sum them up separately, or if they were subtracted, get each individual sum and subtract them, find the difference, whatever it is, doesn't matter. And that's how you do it. You don't have to worry about the big glob. You can break it into smaller pieces. One of the formulas that you're going to get is that if you sum up a constant n times, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you know, all the way to n, you get that constant times n. And that's a natural result from this. Remember, we factor out a constant. If we factor out a constant, that's just a 1. And if we're going to add 1 n times, well, that's just n, right? If it was 2 times, it'd be 2. 3 times, it'd be 3, right? And then you have the constant. So this is a direct result of this. This one's a little more complex. We, if we sum up the index from 1 to n, you actually get this formula. Whatever the, the upper bound is here, it's the upper bound times the upper bound plus 1 over 2. I recommend you go try this. Try this for, um, for like 5, for instance. If you sum up 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, you get 15. So if I instead plug it into this formula, 5 times 6, which is 30, over 2, I get 15. And you might say to yourself, okay, well, that's not a big deal. I could sum up 1 to 5. That's true. But what if you had to sum up 1 to 100? Well, that would take you a while. But instead, you could just say 100 times 101 over 2, which would like be, be like saying 50 times 101, which is what, 5,050? So 50, 50. So that's a really simple way to do that. What we find is we also have formulas for both I squared and I cubed. Now, I cubed is easy to remember because it's actually this formula squared, right? n squared, n plus 1 squared, 2 squared is 4. So these are relatively easy to remember. This one's a little more complicated. You have an n, you have an n plus 1, but then you have this 2n plus 1, and you divide it by 6. So that one can be a little harder to remember. This one's usually, you end up doing this enough as you study more in calculus and other methods that this one kind of sticks in your head. This one, not as much. And then, of course, this one, again, is just an easier, is, is, a, or is re very related to this. So what we can do is when we find these things that are based on the index, we can use these, these properties with these formula to, to quickly evaluate results.